another another really interesting thing that blew me away in the book was that <clears throat> are we become more similar to our DNA over time? So like yeah. this, this is, this is clearly like against intuition. Like how, how could this be right? We go through life, all of these events hit us. We do all of these things. We work hard at things. We change our identity based on life experiences, or we think they're based on life experiences. Yes. Are we become more similar to our twins? Even if we're reared apart, we become more close to our, to our DNA. Can you, can you explain this a bit? Yeah. Well, just to underline the puzzling aspect of this, if it doesn't puzzle people, is B.F. Skinner, who's this famous environmentalist in America, learning psychologist, you know, he, his whole life is spent showing the environment is important, but in the sense of you can control things, you can change things, but that's a can, what you can do versus what is question. But later in life, he wrote a book on aging. He lived to about 90 or something like that. And in that book on aging, he said, the older I get, the more I become who I am. The older I get, the more I become who I am. That could, should kind of sink in for people, because I guarantee you, as you grow up and get old, you'll, you'll see that. You, you know, I had a striking experience once where I've had a beard for 40 years or 50 years. And one holiday, I decided to shave it off. And I looked in the mirror and I said, oh, my God, there's my father. The older, the older, the more, you know, my face kind of got leaner and more like his as I move, moved from a young man to a, an older man. But you'll see that in terms yeah. of personality, too. You'll begin to recognize some things you don't like about your parents, like my father became, it was quick tempered, you know, and it's not pleasant to see in people, you know, they fly into a rage about something. And, you know, I find I have a tendency towards that. And again, it's, it's good. It helps me because I recognize okay, I got to cool it, you know, just before you let yourself go, you just say, wait a minute now, I suffer more than anyone when I, I become really angry. I don't get over it quickly, you know. So I think it is important to recognize that um, genetics becomes more important as we get older. And as you're saying, if people, if I ask people, does heritability increase or decrease, they won't know what I'm talking about. But if I explain to yeah. them, well, do you think environmental factors become more important as you go through life. And a lot of people would say yes, but it's because they misunderstand how genes work. They think genes only have an effect at birth, at conception, you know, and then after that, it's just like they're hanging out there and it's the environment that makes a difference. But based on all that we've said, yeah. you, you see that it, that the inherited DNA differences make a difference later in life. Like schizophrenia, you don't really see anything in kids who have a high genetic propensity to schizophrenia until their brain passes adolescence when the brain is mature enough to be able to have hallucinations and delusions and you know create false realities for themselves so genes do change during development and and increase and especially for cognitive abilities this is the strongest finding that the heritability of cognitive ability like most people say IQ general cognitive ability as well as specific cognitive abilities goes up linearly throughout development from, say, 20% of the variance in infancy, 40% in childhood, 60% in mid-adulthood. And then some people say even higher later in life at 80, if you exclude dementia, which is its own thing, you know, but of course lowers cognitive ability a lot. So that's really amazing because we're not talking about tiny effects here. We're, again, psychology rarely explains 5% of the variance. Well, we're starting off at 20% with infancy. But then yeah. by childhood in the early school years, 40%, then 60%, then 80%. And the next question always is, but what? why is that? And the answer is nobody knows. But most people believe it has to do with what we're talking about earlier. It isn't that genes are hard, hardwired and make, you know, say like vocabulary is the most highly heritable cognitive test. But that doesn't mean that those words are somehow you know, imprinted in your brain. It's not hardwired. What it has to do is if you see kids who are verbal, like one of my grandchildren is just verbally very good. She always wants to know about nuances of word. Why do you use that word than this word, you know? And, you know, she's going to, she's got a great vocabulary, even at eight or whatever, and she's going to have a much better vocabulary because she's just tuned into that channel. And that's the way genes work. Yeah. It's they, they, 
you know, just give you little nudges. It's, it's sort of what you like to do. You like to learn about that. It may have been music or athletics, but with her, it's this verbal channel. And then my, to my other grandchildren, you know, it's like, whatever, you know what I mean, which is also a reasonable response. I mean, communication is just about me understanding them. You know, it doesn't have to be this subtle, yeah. sophisticated sort of thing. So it's interesting that for cognitive abilities, that the heritability increases linearly, and that's a well-established finding. For a lot of other things, it doesn't change that much. But where it changes, where heritability changes, it tends to go up in development. And the reason that's interesting is because if people understood what you're talking about, they might say, well, of course, environmental differences make more of a difference because, you know, the genes are what you get at birth. And then after that, accidents, illnesses, parents, school, friends, everything else, you know, come a, a cruise really it accumulates during your life so it's not unreasonable to expect that environmental differences become more important which would mean that genetic differences relatively become less important but again it's just interesting to know that doesn't seem to be true and i think these surprising findings are really cool you know where people sit up and say hmm, i didn't know that they absolutely are they're very interesting the, the, the specific example that you have in the book where if twins that are reared apart, they do an IQ test at, you know, younger in adolescence, they're more likely to diverge, but as they both go on their separate lives and it doesn't matter if one of them is in the North pole and the other one is in the South pole and their experiences couldn't be more different. I am, their IQs tend to converge. And if they take a test at 60, they'll be more similar than they were at 15. That's pretty astounding. It's very strange. I yeah. know you said we don't know why, but I love to I love to even take off the scientist hat for a while and speculate because this is a, an informal podcast. I'd love to even get your intuition. Do you think that evolutionarily that's a bug, a feature or an accident? No, I think it's definitely a feature. I think it's along the lines of what we were okay. talking about, where the environment isn't just things like accidents and illnesses that happen to us. Most of the environment in psychology that affects us psychologically is experience. And that has to do with this selecting, modifying, even creating environments correlated with our genetic propensities. So you really see that for cognitive ability. You know, people who are interested in reading and thinking and talking and understanding, they create their environments. They have their friends, their spouse. They read. They, you know, they, they just foster their genetic propensity. So that my parents, who died a few years ago, they were in this old people's home where there were a lot of very bright people around, and they weren't lobotomized sitting in front of the television. They were at this place because there were people who were interesting and wanted to talk about things, you know? And so I, that was a question of selecting an environment. So, you know, selecting an old people's home where people were, you know, engaged. And so I think you see it, see it throughout life, and I certainly see it in my grandchildren. I could have predicted which of them were going to go on academically from a very early age, just by their, the way they interacted with their environment. You know, I also studied these super bright kids early in life, and that's eye-opening. If you've ever seen either, say, a musically talent, you know, I hear what you were saying about you don't necessarily need talent, especially for tennis. But like with music, you do see some kids who very early on, they can, you know, you play Absolutely. a melody, they can just sing it back to you, you know. It's not just perfect pitch and stuff like that. You know, so I think um, when you see these really bright kids, it, it isn't sort of the environment. It's not like they have tutors who give them calculus at the age of eight or something. It's, they go into a room and they ask questions like, have you ever noticed that the corners are at these angles? You know, and you say, what? But, you know, it's... There's questioning it, everything. They're using the yeah. same environment very differently. And I think teachers see that a yeah. lot. You can't stand in front of 30 kids and realize some of them are really... They're so far ahead of you, you know, you just got to stay out of their way. And the others, it's like you got to really work and work and work to get them up to some minimal levels of literacy and numeracy. Yeah, it reminds me of I remember reading a hypothesis. Now, I don't think there's any 
data for this specifically related to why the prefrontal cortex develops later than the rest of the brain. Mm. And I remember reading that one of the hypotheses for that is so that people are a little less bounded in their adventurousness. You know, like in adolescence is when you're most likely to create a political party or have a coup against an opposing government or become a professional mm. athlete or become a professional musician. It allows for outliers to some extent, because one of the things that the prefrontal cortex does is it kind of creates boundary constraints ar ac across us. And that's why people are a lot more, you know, tending to do outlier like activities in their younger age. I, I wonder, is this somewhat more somewhat related to that as well, that having maybe being slightly more um, departed from your genetic blueprint in the earlier years allows you for more exploration and more adventurousness. And then as time goes on, you really want to be a bit more consolidated. You want to, you know, consolidate it on your, your thinking, your moral beliefs, what you are good at, what you're not good at, your thinking, just everything. As you age, you want to be more, you know, predictable, I guess. That's best for your, your safety, best for your success. I, again, there's no data for this, but I'm curious, are those two related or is there any link between, between that yeah. as well? Well, I know the general uh, question you're asking is about, the, about evolution. And I think it's a good time to bring up the idea that a lot of evolutionary theory is what we call normative. It's talking about the human species. Like you said, the prefrontal cortex develops later for these adaptive reasons. That's normative. It's not about individual differences. And you could have something yeah. that's highly, you know, if, if something's evolutionarily important, people say, oh, well, then it's got to be genetic. But no, because this is the difference between means and variance again. The normative approach is saying, why are humans the way they are? But we're asking about why are humans different? And so there's no necessary relationship between the genetics of individual differences and the genetics of normative development. And a really um, way of underlining this is of the 3 billion base pairs of DNA, you know, base pair, the, a step in the spiral staircase of the double helix of DNA. So of those 3 billion steps, you know, you and I and everyone are similar, at least 99.8% or something like that. You know, so most of those bases, if we sequence your DNA and mine, be all the same. But we're still talking about millions of DNA differences when you've got 3 billion of these base pairs. And so with the, the 3 billion base pairs that are similar among all of us is what makes us human. But it's that 0.1% of the DNA that differs that makes us different. And so it's, it's again, interesting yeah. to think that, you know, it's just a very small portion of all our DNA that differs, but that's responsible for all these differences we see. And evolutionarily, you could argue that DNA variation is money in the bank for evolution. Because one way evolution goes is, you know, they, you can be bred very specifically for this one environment where you don't allow any variation because any variation is bad because you perfectly suited to this environment. But then what happens if the environment changes? You're screwed as a species. So species yeah. that are evolved to handle different environments will generally have more DNA variation that, you know, it, it has to be held within limits a little too much and, you know, it's, it's maladaptive. But on average, you know, that variability is like money in the bank for changing environments evolutionarily. And that's what humans are especially good at. Yeah. If you enjoyed that short podcast clip, then I'm so confident you will enjoy even more the full conversation. You can click it here. Click it. Come on. You know you want to. Click it.